Well, welcome to the audio lectures for MassCom 101. We will begin with Chapter 1 in Ralph Hansen's Mass Communication Text. Certainly the term fake news has been thrown around a lot over the last couple of years. Now that said, there's been something like fake news around for a long time. Uh, what makes this term difficult to pin down is that people can mean different things when they use the term fake news. Your textbook author, Ralph Hansen, has identified five common usages of the term fake news. So, let's examine what they are. The first definition of fake news is satire. Uh, satire is exaggerated. Uh, sometimes you take a second look at it. Sometimes people are fooled into thinking that satire is, is actually real. Uh, usually satire has a, a serious underlying point. When we think about social and political satire in the United States, I think of the, uh, the website The Onion, which has been around for quite a long time. A second definition of fake news is when legitimate media just plain old makes a mistake, or when legitimate media are fooled by unethical uh, reporters or even sources of news stories. Uh, let me explain the uh, newspaper front page that you're seeing. This is from uh, late February uh, 1942. This is the so-called Battle of Los Angeles. It didn't happen. On an evening in late February 1942, early in America's involvement in the Second World War, where there was widespread fear that the West Coast was vulnerable to enemy attack, something was spotted over the skies of Los Angeles. We still don't know what it was, but it caused anti-aircraft fire to swing into action, and there was a lot of panic during that evening. Some news media understood it for what it was, war jitters, while others, including the Los Angeles Examiner, the Hearst newspaper in the city, it reported the so-called battle as fact. Uh, I don't think they were trying to mislead. I think they just plain old got it wrong. Other times, reputable media will be drawn in by reporters trying to make a career for themselves by coming up with incredible stories that are so incredible that they aren't true. What a good media outlet will do when it finds that it has been fooled by an unethical reporter or even photographer is they will first fire the journalist, and then they will apologize to the readers and tell them what happened. A third definition of fake news is clickbait. And sometimes the, uh, the reason for this clickbait is profit. Other times it is politically partisan uh, to try to oftentimes scare people uh, toward a particular point of view. In the 2016 election, partisan clickbait is, was believed to have been a, a real problem. The fourth definition of fake news is foreign manipulation. You know, we really don't know if Russia changed the outcome of the 2016 presidential election. I'm not sure we'll ever know that for sure. But we do know that there were automated bots that were a presence on Twitter. And oftentimes they were spreading uh, misleading or provocative messages that were designed to make worse the internal divisions that are already in American society. The fifth definition of fake news is simply news that someone doesn't like. It has become a way to discredit 
uh, journalistic reports that are damning or inconvenient. What is communication? Well, that's a good question to ask at the beginning of a mass communication course. It is how we interact with the world. And there are all kinds of messages, verbal, nonverbal, informational, emotional. Um, and as, as you look at uh, uh, the, the photos at the bottom of this slide, you can see three different levels of communication. You know, one type of communication is one-on-one, -on -one, interpersonal communication. As we see at the lower right, uh, one person is apparently communicating verbally, while the other person is communicating through body language. Another level of communication is uh, the, the, the photo in the middle. And this is group communication. And with this group communication, we can see that it is uh, uh, through the modern smartphone. Maybe they are all texting uh, friends. Maybe they are texting uh, uh, social media groups. The third photo, uh, the one on the left, is mass communication. It is an interview for a local television news program. And uh, uh, a hallmark of mass communication is there are very few people involved in the preparation of the message relative to the number of receivers of the message. This graphic in chapter one shows the four levels of communication. Now please note that at the broad base of the pyramid, what that shows is that it is more frequent and everyone is doing it. For example, intrapersonal communication, which we did not talk about on the previous slide, intrapersonal communication is communication inside your own head. It's your own interior monologue. Interpersonal communication is one-to-one -one communication. Group communication is what happens when we are in class, whether it is online or in person. And then at the very tip top of the pyramid is mass communication. And the reason why it is so narrow at the top is that while the audiences are big, the number of people who are able to be mass communicators are relatively small. So let's, uh, let's delve a little bit more into this idea of what is mass communication. You know, it used to be that you needed to have an institution behind you to be a mass communicator. In the internet age, I think a clever individual can also be a mass communicator. A hallmark of mass communication is its impersonalness. Uh, the, the, the messages are sent out to large mixed audiences, and while the sender, you know, oftentimes knows in broad demographic terms who the audience is, on a personal basis, they don't know each individual. A feature of this course that is going to become more apparent as we go through the chapters is it seems that every traditional method of mass communication now has its digital double. And, you know, what do I mean by that? Well, think about paper books uh, being superseded by uh, e-books. Or think about newspapers uh, being surpassed by online newspapers. Now, even movies and movie theaters uh, to some degree are being superseded by uh, streaming platforms and people viewing movies on digital devices. The SMCR model worked for quite a long time and I think the key to why it has survived is that it's very good at identifying the players in the mass communication process. So in the next four slides, we're going to go through what the S, the M, the C, and the R all mean. The S in this model is the sender. 
And the sender oftentimes is an organization, and sometimes it's an individual that is behind the mass communication message. Think about the Oxford English Dictionary. Whose message is that? As, as far as I know about the preparation of that dictionary, there is a small army of lexiconographers who contribute to it. And then, of course, there are editors and others. So that would very much be an organization. If we're talking about a very large global news organization like BBC News, while you may have a reporter who is identified as reporting the story, and you may have sources who are identified as being quoted in the story, once again, that message would be the product of a large organization. Of course, today, an individual with a compelling message can become an online mass communicator, such as the woman uh, at the lower left of this slide, uh, Anita Sarkeesian. She is a, a, a critic of the male-dominated gamer culture from a feminist perspective. The M in this model stands for the message, and the message is the content. And please note that content can really vary by the type of message. You know, look at the, uh, the Star Wars script, which is pictured uh, in the middle of the three illustrations below. Yes, it is written, but it's not informational. It's there to entertain. Let's look at the uh, black and white image at the uh, lower right. That is a famous photojournalistic image. World War II has ended. From the subject matter of the photo, it, you can tell that it's a victory photo. Uh, and by the time that people saw this photo in newspapers and magazines, they already knew the war was over. They already knew that we had won. So what was the purpose of the photo? and that is the emotional impact of the news. What better than this dramatic image to get across the idea that the war is over. We don't have to get shot at or shoot anyone anymore. Now we can begin to make lives for ourselves. The C in this model is the channel. And the channel aligns with the medium that is used to transmit the message. Is this a television broadcast? Is this uh, streamed music? Is this uh, a movie shown in theaters? What is the channel? So let's, uh, let's get you on the chat box here. Um, what mass media can you name? And of course, there's the real obvious ones. But I'll bet if you really start to apply yourself, you'll find out that there are some mass media that you really don't think about very much, even if they are a part of your life. The R in this model is the receiver. And of course, if we're talking about mass media, there's lots and lots of receivers. That's what makes it mass. So. Think about how mass messages get out to their large numbers of receivers. The two pictures on this slide are both about the mass audiences for music. You know, up until a little over a hundred years ago, if a lot of people were to hear the same musical performance, they would all have to be in the same place, such as this photo at the lower left of the Hollywood Bowl. Of course, today, and especially uh, recently, we can all hear the same musical performance virtually through a broadcast, through streaming, or other means. Let's talk about some other ways to look at how we use mass communications. One of them is the ritual model whereby mass media usage
becomes part of the pattern of our lives. So if you're at a Major League Baseball game, you get to stand up in the middle of the seventh inning. It's called the seventh inning stretch. And they always play the same song, Take Me Out to the Ball Game. Or imagine that your parents uh, like to watch the first part of a late night talk show. Maybe the monologue, which usually runs between 11 and 11.15 p.m. And then after they've seen that, they typically uh, go to bed. Now, that would be a ritualistic use of media. It becomes a habit. It becomes part of the rhythms of their life. Another way to look at media and its effect on us is the publicity model. The publicity model is where we convey, we the audience, we convey importance on someone, not necessarily because they've done something important, just because they are getting a lot of media attention. I mean, think about the notion of people who are famous for being famous. We treat them as important. Well, why? Have they developed a cure for coronavirus? Uh, are they building millions of respirators? No, they're famous for being famous, and somehow that equates to importance. Let's also take a look at the reception model. And the reception model looks at, you know, how do we take meaning out of what we see, out of what we hear, out of what we read? I want to talk just briefly about the historical section in this first chapter. For the most part, I want you to just read it and think about it, but I, I do have a few comments. Uh, first, take a look at the woodcut illustration. That's the one in black and white, lower center. This depicts the, mo uh, the, the moment when Johann Gutenberg created his first printing press. Now, the historic significance is not just that he created a printing press, it's that he created a system of movable type. This was a flexible, scalable system that led to the mass production of the printed word. And certainly, uh, several centuries later, uh, by about 1830, when the steam engine was hooked up to the printing press, then you really have the beginnings of mass media. Also on this slide, uh, I want you to uh, look at the winged goddess who is fluttering over the American frontier. This is a painting that is owned by the Autry Museum in Griffith Park. It is entitled American Progress. You may wonder what that winged goddess is doing uh, fluttering over the American frontier. She is stringing telegraph wire. I don't think you realize today how important an invention the telegraph was. It was the first ever electronic form of communication. It allowed coded messages to be sent over vast distances almost immediately.
Neil Postman was an academic who wrote 18 books. The height of his career was probably the 1980s and 1990s, and the medium that he commented on the most was television. His most famous book was the 1985 book, Amusing Ourselves to Death. And it was in that book where he most clearly stated his central thesis, that television was a trivializing device, that no matter how serious something was, television just had a knack of turning it into entertainment. And what it did to us without us even realizing it, by us I mean the audience, is we began to evaluate everything as entertainment, whether it be uh, a deadly virus, a political assassination, or a situation comedy. We began to evaluate all of those things through the same entertainment-based lens. The question I have for you, and uh, I, I sure like to uh, read your views in the, in the chat box, is this something that only happens with television? Does the internet also trivialize deadly serious events? Chapter 1 lists four basic dimensions of media literacy. Let's go through them on the next four slides. The cognitive dimension is the ability to process the information in an intellectual sense. So let's take uh, Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451. I've reproduced the cover of it at lower left. When I ask in class, how old were you uh, when you read Fahrenheit 451, I will get a range of answers. I'll have some students who will say they read it in the seventh grade, and I will have other students who say they read it in high school, and I will have other students who say that they read it just very recently at Glendale College. Now, a novel can be read on many levels. So if you were that seventh grader who read Fahrenheit 451, and I'm your teacher, and I ask you, you know, what was the book about? What I would expect to get back from uh, a diligent seventh grader is a summary of the plot. Okay, fair enough. If I'm teaching English 104 at Glendale College, however, and I ask you, you know, what is Fahrenheit 451 about? If you just come back with a summary of the plot, then you're not going to get a very good grade. The cognitive dimension in this case, as an adult looking at a serious piece of uh, fiction, uh, such as uh, Fahrenheit 451, is I want to know what are the themes in this book. You know, on, on a very obvious basis, it's about censorship. Uh, but there are other themes that people could pull out of it. It's about ideas that are troubling. It's about conformism versus dissent. You know, it's about a lot of things. Uh, let's take a look at the newspaper editorial that is uh, lower center on this slide. Uh, this is an editorial from the Sunday New York Times in 1996 when uh, that became the first American newspaper to write an editorial in favor of same-sex marriage. Now, obviously, this editorial is a, a cultural milestone, but where it fits in in the cognitive dimension of media literacy is I think you need to know a little bit more about issues going on in society to get something out of a New York Times editorial than you do a story about a baseball game. You know, I, I would imagine that in, in this editorial, that there were legal decisions and there were situations that it referred to that if you knew about those things because you were keeping up with the news, that you'd get a lot more out of that editorial. The emotional dimension of media literacy looks at how media messages, well, affect our emotions. Let's uh, uh, contemplate for a moment the fellow who is in the slide on this screen, Rush Limbaugh, 
the very conservative uh, syndicated radio commentator. Mr. Limbaugh's talent is the ability to rile up his audience. His audience, and I think it's fair to say, is mostly older, mostly white males. And he is pitch perfect at creating outrage in his audience. <laughs> That's why he gets paid the big bucks. The aesthetic dimension of media literacy is appreciating media content as art. So let's think about the uh, Orson Welles film Citizen Kane. Made in 1941 in glorious black and white, Citizen Kane is thought by many uh, uh, serious film critics to be perhaps the greatest American film ever made. So you hear this and uh, you watch uh, Citizen Kane over the weekend and you come back to me next week and you say, I don't know why it's such a great film. I would have enjoyed any Star Wars film more. And yes, I'd understand that comment. But I'd say you're not evaluating a film like Citizen Kane on the right basis. You know, when you look about when you look at a film like that, you 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 look at it as a piece of uh, filmatic art. You look at the camera angles. You look at the use of overlapping dialogue. You know, you you look at things that are more than just overt entertainment. The uh, color photo that we have on this slide is uh, of uh, what has become a, a, uh, uh, a big part of summer in Griffith Park, and that is independent Shakespeare, live free Shakespeare performances under the stars. So you go to an independent Shakespeare performance of Hamlet, and you report to me, gosh, I, I think I would have uh, had more fun watching Shrek the Musical. And I'd say, well, again, you're not appreciating this for what it is. You know, you, what, the way you should approach live Shakespeare is to look for the themes in Shakespeare's ancient plays and how they still resonate in the current era and how, in this case, the Independent Shakespeare Company has taken those themes and made them seem even more current. The fourth basic dimension of media literacy is the moral dimension, and that is to try to get a sense of what the values of a particular medium is. So, for example, we have a uh, three covers from Time Magazine, and there is something here to anger both conservatives and liberals. Now, let's take a look at the first two covers. For one thing, they seem to take a point of view, and the point of view is that uh, Mr. Trump is uh, melting down under the pressures uh, of the office. And you'd say, hey, wait a minute. Isn't Time a news magazine? And isn't a news magazine supposed to be neutral? And isn't this cover not neutral? Isn't it commentary? Well, I would agree with you that Time is a news magazine. Uh, I would agree with you that the covers are not neutral. They, they do have a point of view. But I would say, well, wait a minute. The purpose of Time Magazine, what, what it has always portrayed itself as, is an interpreter of news. And this is their interpretation that uh, Mr. Trump uh, has some unstable moments. Now, at the same time, uh, you know, I, I can understand where those two covers would outrage conservatives. But let's take a look at the third illustration here, where uh, Time uh, named Mr. Trump Person of the Year hey, there's something to outrage liberals. Well, again, the moral dimension. You have to understand the values of what time is trying to say when it names someone person of the year. It isn't saying that this is the best person. It is saying this is the person who changed the course of the world 
the most. In the year that Time Magazine named Mr. Trump Person of the Year, uh, in their estimation, he had changed the course of not just the United States, but our allies in NATO and, and others around the world more than any other person. I would imagine that Time uh, uh, will probably name coronavirus the virus of the year. Does it mean they like coronavirus? Well, no. Here are some other thoughts about media literacy that aren't in the textbook. I think they're important, so I'll give it to you here and now. All media messages are constructions. And what that means is, is reality is really big, too big to fit even into a lengthy media message. I mean, for example, you know, the Los Angeles Times is pretty big some days. It, it can be over 100 pages. But yet, think about every event that happens, not just around Los Angeles or Southern California, but around the world. You know, obviously there are messages that are deemed so important that they make it into page one. And then there are other messages that are still pretty darned important, and maybe they make it on page 12 of the newspaper. But then there's a lot of other things that don't make it at all. Or think about when the photographer comes back with, uh, with 50 photos. We will put three in the newspaper, and we will take the best dozen and put them on the website. All media messages are constructions. Or think about the writers who, you know, maybe turned in a 1,700-word story, but the editor says, well, we'll cut it by about 300 words, you know, to get that into the paper. Or think about, think about if we were to do a television news uh, uh, documentary about Glendale College, and we were to get an entire hour to show the audience what Glendale College is all about. Would we be able to tell the story of every student? Would we be able to show what it's like in every classroom? No. You'd need a 500-hour documentary, and even that wouldn't get in everything. All media messages are targeted, and what that means is media outlets generally know, oftentimes in great detail, who their typical reader, viewer, or listener is. And so they calibrate their media message knowing who that viewer, listener, or reader is. I mean, for example, just imagine how different story selection would be for the LA Times if their average reader turned out to be a 19-year-old college student. Or just imagine how different Rush Limbaugh's syndicated radio show would be if his average listener wasn't, say, a 65-year-old white male and was instead a 25-year-old female of color. Another thought about media literacy is that all media messages are trying to sell you something. And sometimes it's obvious, and sometimes it isn't. You know, let's think about a top morning drive time disc jockey who is very widely listened to from, say, 7 to 9 a.m. in the greater Los Angeles area. Well, there's stuff on that show that's obviously being sold. The ads for concert tickets and car insurance and whatnot. A little less obvious is the music that is being played on the show. Well, uh, play on radio show leads to music sales. So that's a form of, of something that's being sold to you. And then what about the radio personality himself or herself? You know, trying to sell his or her own fame so that they can t continue to be a top-rated and highly paid radio personality. To some degree, they're selling their own cult of personality. I have one more thought about media literacy. And this is also a thought that I have about education in general. You know, it isn't about always knowing the answers. Sometimes what critical thinking is about is the ability to ask good questions. And so as you leave this first chapter and you begin to think more about the course, 
ask yourself, you know, when when you when you see, read, or hear something in the media, does it just wash over you uncritically? Or do you have the ability to ask good questions about it?